throughout the ages, man has envisioned himself traveling to our nearest neighbor in the vast reaches of space, the moon. In this early sketch, he foresaw a lunar voyage and perhaps a sailing ship. It is interesting that on man's second journey to the surface of the moon, the crew likened their vehicles to sailing ships. The call signs selected for their spacecraft, Yankee Clipper and Intrepid. The mission emblem carried out the motif. The astronaut crew, three officers of the United States Navy. Man's first venture to set foot on another celestial body occurred in July 1969. Neil Armstrong and Edwin Aldrin proved that man could safely land on the moon, walk upon its surface, and perform useful work to add to our knowledge of the moon, the earth, and the universe. The outstanding success of the epical first manned lunar landing brought us to the threshold of further exploration of the moon on follow-on Apollo missions. Apollo 12 was the first manned mission to be assigned the operational objectives of inspecting, surveying, and working on the surface of the moon. The two astronauts assigned to the landing mission rehearsed the lunar work many times on Earth. The astronauts were scheduled to leave their spacecraft twice while on the moon. During the first period of activity, they would set up the Apollo Lunar Surface Experiments package, conduct extensive photographic assignments, and collect soil samples near the spacecraft. During the second period, they were to locate the unmanned Surveyor 3 spacecraft, which soft landed on the moon on the 17th of April, 1967, and transmitted over 6,000 pictures back to Earth. The astronauts were to remove several parts from the surveyor, including its television camera, and return them to Earth for investigation. The three members of the Apollo 12 crew were Mission Commander Charles Conrad, Command Module Pilot Richard Gordon, and Alan Bean, the Lunar Module Pilot. The final countdown of the Apollo 12 space vehicle was begun on Friday, November 7th. On November 10th, a leak was discovered in a hydrogen fuel tank in the spacecraft service module. The launch team worked around the clock to replace the faulty tank as the countdown continued. If they had not been successful, the Apollo 12 liftoff would have been postponed until the next launch window in December. Rain showers and overcast skies were forecast for launch day, November 14, 1969. Since the wind was moderate and the ceilings were above minimum, the countdown continued. The astronauts arrived at the launch pad at 8.30 a.m. and proceeded to the top of the launch tower. They crossed the access arm and entered the white room. The closeout crew assisted each of the astronauts in entering the command module, which would be their primary base of operations during their 10-day lunar mission. The President of the United States, Richard Nixon, came to the spaceport for the Apollo 12 launch. This was the first time a president in office witnessed the liftoff of a manned space vehicle. Despite continuing showers, the president and his family joined other guests at the viewing stand and remained there throughout the launch activities. Vice President Spiro Agnew watched the countdown from the launch control center. Rocco Patron, the new Apollo program director, and Dr. George Miller, head of the manned spaceflight program, were also present in the firing room. With a continuous check on local weather, the countdown moved along with no unscheduled holds. 
under the direction of Dr. Kurt Debus and launch director Walter Caprian. As with the six previous Apollo Saturn V launches, the countdown reached ignition precisely on schedule. 10, 9, 8, ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, for all engines running. Liftoff took place at 11.22 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. A pitch and a roll program, and this baby is really going. Pete Conrad reporting the roll and pitch program to put Apollo 12 on the proper course. Altitude at one half mile. Roll's complete. Roger, Pete. At T plus 36 seconds, communications were momentarily lost with the Apollo command module. This was attributed to a discharge of static electricity generated by the space vehicle as it rose through the rain and clouds. Oh, you've got your GDC. Okay, we just lost the platform, gang. I don't know what happened here. We had everything in the world drop out. Roger. Plus one. Fuel cell lights and AC bus light and fuel cell disconnect. AC bus overload one and two, main bus A and B out. Despite the brief electric failure in the spacecraft, the three stages of the Saturn V operated flawlessly to place Apollo 12 into near-circular parking orbit above the Earth. During two revolutions, the spacecraft's computer was updated and all instruments checked for any damage caused by the power failure. Over Australia, Mission Control gave go for translunar injection and the Saturn's third stage was reignited to boost Apollo 12 into a lunar trajectory. 400 miles above Earth, the Apollo Command Service Module separated, turned around, and maneuvered into position to dock with the lunar module. Docking was completed precisely as planned. The lunar module was then removed from the third stage of the Saturn V. Okay, 12, the lighting in the tunnel looks uh, pretty good now. Okay, and if you'll hold it just a minute, I'll get the uh, window shades down in the lab here. There we go. To ensure that the electrical systems of the lunar module had not been affected during launch, the crew entered the lunar spacecraft ahead of time to check the systems. All results were positive. Okay. So I'll run the checklist to uh, minus six minutes. Okay. 31 hours after liftoff, the astronauts fired the spacecraft's main engine to make a course transfer. The engine burn moved Apollo 12 into a hybrid trajectory. The maneuver committed a manned spacecraft for the first time to a non-free return trajectory rather than looping the moon for an automatic free return to Earth. The astronauts had the capability to move back into a free return trajectory by firing either the main engine or the lunar module descent propulsion engine should the need arise. The hybrid trajectory permitted a saving of fuel and allowed the lunar module to land under optimum lighting conditions. Power up and on. Nearing the moon on the third day of the mission, the spacecraft's main engine was fired twice to slow Apollo 12 and place it into the desired 62 by 75 mile orbit above the moon. During the first lunar orbit, good quality television coverage was received with an excellent description of the lunar features by the crew. It's got a nice central peak in the middle. And let me see if I can get it better for you. There it is. Can you see that central peak there? That's the full word. I told. I'm doing it good. The rim itself. Let me uh, point the camera back. Past the stars. 
concrete wall again. Let me give you another view of that because it's coming in even greater relief from this angle. Then I'll go back and give you the horizon because that's one of the most impressive things right here. Take a look at those mountains. Uh, we have The lunar landing maneuver began on the fourth day of the mission when Conrad and Bean activated all systems of the lunar module. In order to avoid any minor velocity changes, a soft undocking of the two spacecraft was initiated. Lunar module power was not used to separate the two spacecraft as in previous missions. This was but one of the procedures followed by the crew to improve navigational accuracy in an attempt to achieve a pinpoint landing on the predetermined lunar landing site. Several minutes later, Command Module Pilot Gordon fired the small engines to turn his spacecraft and gently move away from the lunar module. The Apollo 12 astronauts had previously elected to use the call sign Intrepid for the lunar module and Yankee Clipper for the command module. Fifty-nine minutes after undocking, Conrad fired Intrepid's descent engine, which placed the lunar module into an orbit with a low point of 50,000 feet above the moon. At that altitude, powered descent to the surface of the moon was initiated. Unlike the Apollo 11 mission, Apollo 12 approached the landing site in a windows-up attitude for continuous updating of landing radar data and for better communications. That's it, there's LPD. Roger, copy P-64. Hey, there it is. There it is, son of a gun, right down the middle of the road. Outstanding, 42 degrees, Pete. Hey, it's targeted right from 42. the center of the crater. Hey, look out there. I can't believe it. Amazing. Fantastic. 42 degrees, Pete. Just keep talking. The spacecraft was rotated to a Windows forward attitude at 7,000 feet for the visual final approach. The crew took over manual control at 370 feet. I just want LPD to the right a little. Roger, okay, Roger. 40 degrees, LPD. 40 That's degrees. so fantastic, I can't believe it. You're at 2,000 feet. How far? The boys on the ground do okay. 1,800 feet up, 39 degrees. Hey, look at that crater right where it's supposed to be. Hey, you're beautiful. Hey, you're really maneuvering around. Come on down, Pete. Okay. 50 feet coming down. Watch for the dust. Now, 46. Low level. 42 feet coming down at 3. Coming down at 2. Okay. Start the clock. 42 feet coming down at 2. 40 coming down at 2. Looking good. Watch the dust. 31. 32. 30 feet. Coming down at 2, Pete. You got plenty of gas. Plenty of gas, dude. Hang in there. 30 seconds. 18 feet coming down at 2. He's got it made. Come on in there. 24 feet. Contact light. Roger. Copy contact. The rakes are closed. Good landing. Pete, outstanding, man. After I'm on, beautiful. Touchdown occurred at 1.54 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on the 19th of November at the predicted landing site within 600 feet of the Surveyor spacecraft. The first task performed on the moon was a thorough check of the lunar module in preparation for a possible early liftoff. About three hours after touchdown, Conrad and Bean donned their portable life support systems and prepared for the first period of work on the moon's surface. Commander Conrad left the lunar module first. As he descended, he opened the equipment bay, exposing a television camera which transmitted the first color television from the moon. At 6.44 a.m., Conrad stepped from the lunar module and became the third man in history to stand upon the lunar surface. Okay, got the old camera running. Okay. Down to the, the pad. Okay. And that may have been a fall and for Neil, but that's a long one for me. I'm going to step off the pad, Mark. He first evaluated his ability to move about, and then collected a contingency soil sample near the lunar module. Thirty minutes later, Alan Bean began his descent to the lunar surface. In
In moving the television camera from the lunar module to a distant point, the camera is believed to have been inadvertently pointed toward the sun, damaging the Viticon tube. Several unsuccessful attempts were made to restore transmission. The flag of the United States of America was implanted on the moon, and the solar wind experiment deployed. The aluminum foil was designed to capture particles emitted by the sun and was retrieved prior to leaving the lunar surface. The exterior of the lunar module was thoroughly inspected and the depth of the foot pads was photographed. The Apollo Lunar Surface Experiments package was then offloaded from the storage bay. A capsule containing radioactive plutonium was removed with some difficulty from its container. The nuclear-powered thermoelectric generator will produce 63 watts of electricity for over two years and is the first nuclear power plant used on the moon. The 50-pound experiment package, which weighed about 300 pounds on Earth, was carried approximately 200 yards from the spacecraft. The six experiments were deployed at this distance around the central communications station so that the instruments would not be damaged during liftoff from the moon. A solar wind spectrometer was set up to monitor the interaction of solar wind particles with the moon. A passive seismic experiment was deployed to measure meteoroid impacts and moon quakes. A magnetometer measures any changes in the magnetic field on the moon. An ion detector measures the number of positive ions near the lunar surface. An ion gauge measures minute changes in lunar atmosphere density. The sixth experiment, mounted on the central station, measures dust collection on the experiments. Carefully selected rock samples were collected on the return trip to the lunar module. A core tube was inserted into the lunar surface to obtain a sample of the top 16 inches of soil. The astronauts returned to the lunar module after working four hours and six minutes on the lunar surface to begin a rest period. During the time the two explorers worked on the moon, astronaut Gordon was busy in the command module, performing multispectral photography, plus photographing desirable targets of opportunity. Prior to leaving the spacecraft for the second time, an updated plan was formulated between the crew, geologists on Earth, and mission control. It included returning to the experiment site and to four local craters on the way to the Surveyor 3 spacecraft. The second departure from the lunar module was begun one hour and 40 minutes ahead of schedule. The astronauts first cut the cable to the ill-fated color television camera and stowed the camera to return it to Earth for investigation. The highlight of the second tour on the lunar surface for the astronauts was the arrival at the Surveyor 3 site. The spacecraft rested in a 600-foot diameter crater some 50 feet deep, undisturbed in its lonely environment since April 1967. The astronauts obtained extensive photography of the Surveyor. Selected parts of the spacecraft were removed by the astronauts, including part of the power cable a length of aluminum tube, and the small scoop. Finally, the 17-pound Surveyor television camera was removed. Studies on Earth of these articles will reveal the effects of the lunar environment on the man-made materials used in building the spacecraft and its television camera. On the return trip to the lunar module, the astronauts continued to collect carefully documented rock samples. The astronauts spent four hours and ten minutes outside the spacecraft during their second work period. Inside Intrepid's cabin, Conrad and Bean removed their portable life support systems. These were then jettisoned, along with other expendable items, and left behind on the lunar surface. A near-perfect liftoff took place on schedule. Five, four, three, two, one, liftoff. And away we go. Did it fire? 
The two astronauts had spent over 31 hours living and exploring on the moon's ocean of storms. Okay, you've been right down the plane. Okay. What looks a nice good. Pressure look good, Steve. What a nice ride. Everything looks good, Steve. Pressure looks sure good. Sure does. Looks like much of the same territory we passed over before, doesn't it? <laughs> Man, look at that crater we're flying okay. over. Okay. We sure look strange down there amongst all the sand dunes. <laughs> Sorry about that. Three hours after liftoff, rendezvous took place as planned, 69 miles above the lunar surface. The two spacecraft moved together slowly as the pilots aligned their craft for docking. The two lunar explorers then returned to the command module with approximately 100 pounds of lunar samples and surveyor parts. Following the transfer, the ascent stage of the lunar module was jettisoned and its engine reignited by ground command for a deorbit maneuver designed to deliberately impact the stage on the moon. The lunar module Intrepid, which served its crew well, performed its final function, triggering a moon quake which was recorded on a seismometer for a full half hour. Impact occurred about 40 miles south of the Apollo 12 landing area. On the seventh day of the mission, a planned change maneuver was accomplished by firing the main engine to bring Yankee Clipper over three possible lunar landing sites for future Apollo missions. These were extensively photographed with both ordinary and infrared film. After orbiting the moon for 93 hours, the command module's main engine was fired on November 21st to begin the one quarter million mile return trip to Earth. During the three day coast to Earth, the first press conference in space was conducted. And is there any place on Earth you know of that looks like the ocean of storms? A few hours later, the crew witnessed a solar eclipse when the Earth blocked out the light of the sun. This was the first time that man had seen such an eclipse. The Apollo 12 spacecraft entered the Earth's atmosphere on the afternoon of November 24th. The descent of the spacecraft was easily visible from the recovery ship. The spacecraft and crew splashed down in the Pacific Ocean within three and one-half miles of the aircraft carrier, the USS Hornet. The spacecraft landed in an apex down position and quickly righted itself. Approximately one hour later, the crew was transported by helicopter to the aircraft carrier. Aboard the Hornet, the astronauts went directly into the isolation van in which they were transported to the Lunar Receiving Laboratory in Houston. The crew will remain in isolation for up to 21 days following the lunar surface activities. On board the Hornet to welcome the Apollo 12 crew was the head of the manned spaceflight program, Dr. George E. Miller. Dr. Miller was last aboard a recovery ship for the final Gemini flight. This was to be his last official Apollo flight prior to leaving the space agency. Apollo 12, man's second journey to the surface of the moon, was an outstanding success and widely acclaimed by scientists. While the first manned mission proved that man could safely land on the lunar surface, Apollo 12 proved that man could land where he desires with pinpoint accuracy. The Apollo 12 astronauts demonstrated the ability to explore the moon's surface 
far from their spacecraft, to collect a large variety of rock and soil samples, and parts from an earlier unmanned lunar spacecraft, Surveyor 3. The materials brought back will provide additional information concerning the origin of the moon and the effects of the lunar environment on Earth materials. The nuclear-powered laboratory set up by the Apollo 12 crew on the moon is constantly relaying scientific and engineering data to Earth. And the men themselves, through their 31 and a half hour stay on the lunar surface, have much to add to our growing knowledge about living and working on the airless surface of the moon.